Hey, welcome back, Fellowship family and friends. It is awesome to be with you. Listen, I love our online gathering. I love the interaction. So thanks for being a part of this. And thank you to all of you that are generous to the ministry of the Fellowship Church. Some of you tithe to us. And thank you so much for your tithe. Some of you make a one-time donation. We're so grateful for those. And then some of you, this is just part of your regular generosity giving. Uh, we know that there are people that watch all over the United States and even globally now. So welcome in today. Thanks for your generosity as we continue to advance the gospel and uh, share the word of God with people just like you. So we appreciate you so much. I believe God has something very special for all of us today. So grab your Bible, open up to Mark's gospel in the New Testament. We're going to be in chapter 10. Have a notepad or some way to take some notes and get ready to learn from the Word of God today. Hey, let's clear our calculator. Let's just, let's remove all the distractions because there's so much going on in life. I want us to really focus in on an amazing passage today. Let me pray for us as we prepare. Father, thanks so much for your gift of grace in our lives. We thank you for what you're going to teach us today in the 10th chapter of Mark. We are grateful in advance. May you open up our heart and our minds, removing the distractions that could easily keep us from hearing what you would have us to hear today. And we want to focus in now on the teaching of the Word of God. So thank you for an incredible time of worship. May we now enjoy and learn from the Word of God. In Christ's name, amen. Well, several years ago, I, uh, I was a youth pastor at a church in the Atlanta area, and I was introduced to this young couple. Uh, they, were, they were newly married. They didn't have any children. I was somewhat new to the church, and uh, they showed up at our church and visited on a Sunday, and we became friends. And it wasn't long after we struck up a friendship, uh, several weeks, maybe months went by, and they began to serve in our student ministry. And I can just tell you, man, they were an awesome couple to have a friendship with, and we're still friends to this day. But one time, the husband shared his testimony of how he came to know Jesus, and man, it was so good to hear it. He talked about his parents bringing him to church, and he talked about how he was somewhat committed to his Bible study time and trying to grow and learn. Well, I can tell you, there was a Wednesday night in the middle of the fall. It was football season, and we had a whole bunch of students and adults at our church one night, and I was preaching that evening when I gave an invitation to accept Christ, and this young man, newly married, walked down. And when he got down to the front, he said to me something like this. He, he pointed to his head and he said, you know, I know a lot up here about Jesus. But there's about 12 inches between here and here. I need to fill that gap because my heart doesn't know him. tonight." I want to give my heart to Jesus and follow Him. Man, I, I cried. I hugged Him. We went over into a, a, a portion of the room and we got down on our knees and we prayed together and He invited Christ into His heart. That night He went home and His wife embraced Jesus Christ. It's an incredible story of transformation. See, sometimes we have plenty of information without the transformation. Well, that's what Mark's going to talk about today in the 10th chapter. We're going to pick up in verse number 17. And Jesus has been spending um, a really dedicated amount of time to preparing his closest followers. We call them the disciples. Preparing them for his departure. See, he came to this planet, put on flesh with a mission in mind. And that mission was to go to the cross Take your sin and my sin on him. He became sin, friend, for you and I. And God poured out his wrath on his son Jesus. He went to the grave for three days, but rose again on the third morning. And the story we're going to look at today is just weeks before the crucifixion. And he's with his disciples, teaching them, preparing them, when a man that gets so close to Jesus but as we're going to discover, is so far from heaven. I'm going to read the entire passage, and then we're going to break it down and talk about it. So Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 17, as Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him. He knelt down and asked, Good teacher, 
What must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, why do you call me good? Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not uh, testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. The teacher, right, the teacher of the man replied, I, I obeyed all these commandments since I was young. And looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There's still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. You know, in this passage, there's some, there's some key takeaways for us to, to really leverage today for our own application in life. But one of the things I want to make sure that we all understand is when we're studying the Bible, when we're looking at passages, there are some indicators for us on how we can arrive at certain conclusions or maybe certain ways to look at a passage. For example, when something is repeated in the Word of God, man, we are just to take notice, particularly when he talks about it three times, like this passage. Or maybe there's a bookend and he starts with something, ends with something. This passage has that. Uh, it's bookended in verse 17, and then later in the passage, I didn't even read it, it's bookended in verse 30, about eternal life. So we know that this passage is about eternal life. I can just tell you that most people that I encounter when we talk about eternal life, you know what they think about? They think about, and maybe this is you, maybe you think about a quantity of time, and you're thinking about how long eternity is. So for you, it's a length of time. Well. Can I just tell you, maybe you've not thought about it this way, but all of us are eternal beings. Whether you accept Christ or reject Him, we're all eternal beings. We have been created by God, according to chapter 10 and verse number 6, which we just looked at a few weeks ago, and we're created to live forever. So this isn't about a quantity of time that Jesus is going to talk about. It's going to be about a quality of life. So again, it's not length of time, but rather a quality of life. See, everybody's going to live forever. Some are going to live in heaven, but some will be separated from God in a place that Jesus calls hell. So it's about a quality of our life. And Jesus defines the quality of our life as eternal life. And here's kind of how he describes it. He says in verse number 17, this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, talking about the Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. Jesus Christ, He is the only true God, and He is eternal life. So it's not only knowledge of, of a person, but it's having a relationship with the person which is Jesus. Now, in the church world, in Christendom, we call that salvation. Maybe you hear the term born again or giving your life and faith to Jesus. See, that's what eternal life is all about. It's about, as Mark is describing here in chapter 10, it's about knowing Jesus, knowing God intimately, not just having head knowledge, but having a personal relationship knowledge. Eternal life is keeping in mind that Jesus is a real person. He's a real person, and in this story, he's talking to a real guy who had real questions about a real eternal life. And so this story becomes so critical to you and I, and really to this generation, to recognize that eternal life is found in the person of Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, this story is repeated three times in the New Testament. Once in Matthew 19, once in Luke 18, and then here in Mark chapter 10. So we're going to go through this passage and just pull out some things that are somewhat obvious and maybe a little discreet, but that we can apply to our life. So back to verse 17 again. Check out what he was saying. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him. He knelt down and he asked a question. Now, Jesus and his disciples, they're on their way to Jerusalem because 
they have plans to attend the annual Passover festival. And this is a really big deal. It's kind of the best way to think about it. It's kind of like for you and I, Christmas, we get ready, or Thanksgiving, we get ready for all these families to come in, our family to come in, or friends to gather together, and we have special meals. Well, the annual Passover festival was happening over a weekend, but in specific a night where they would remember what God had done from them for them back in Egypt um, many centuries earlier. So everybody's getting ready to head to Jerusalem, and Jesus is heading there with his disciples. And as they travel, here comes a man, and he runs up to Jesus. Now, I think this man is blessed because he has the opportunity to talk face to face with God, with Jesus. He has a one-on-one -on -one session. And not everybody gets to do this, so I just I think this man is blessed to get this opportunity. And there's a few things that we know about the man. And so let me share with you a few things that we know about him because as we start into this passage, it's critical that we know who he is. So the man that, that went and talked, he ran up to talk with Jesus one-on-one -on -one about eternal life, we know that he was a young man. Now, typically in ancient culture, young man, if you know much about the study of God's Word, particularly in the first century, uh, it would mean that he was under 40 years of age. So uh, I'm sorry for all of you, oh man, even myself, all of us over 40 years old, that would put us in the category of old man. Sorry, I, I know I had to say it, but this was a young man. But not only was he a young man, he was a ruler in the synagogue. We find that in Luke chapter 18. So it's unusual for somebody like this to be so young, but he rose in rank so quickly. And he had some influence. Now, most of this, what we know about him, because he's a ruler in the synagogue, means that he is very knowledgeable in the scriptures. Talking about the Old Testament scriptures, obviously the New Testament hadn't been written yet. It's actually, we're reading now the story. So he's got spiritual credibility. People knew him for his study and work in the Old Testament scriptures. But we also know, according uh, to the Word of God, that he was a wealthy man. All three of the passages mention that he is a wealthy guy. So we have a wealthy young man of influence. He's respected. He's educated. We know that because he's a leader in the synagogue, so he's got good education. He's got what we'll call positional authority. He's got that influence. But he's got a moral authority about him as well. He is a spiritual leader. People looked up to him. He's risen quickly to this position of prominence. And this is the way that he approaches Jesus. So just imagine somebody with this kind of credibility, somebody that's got some clout. So as Jesus is starting out on his way to Jerusalem, this man comes running up to him. And what does he do? He kneels down. And he asked the question, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, it's out of character for someone like this in this kind of a position to not only approach Jesus this way, but to run towards him and kneel down. It, it indicates that he is willing to humble himself. And he references Jesus as a good teacher, giving him respect as a rabbi, he comes to Jesus with this sense of urgency. He's a guy that looks like he's got it all together on the outside, but something's not right on the inside. Something's missing. And so he comes to Jesus and he says, listen, what is it that I have to do to spend eternity with God? And Jesus' reply to his question is pretty interesting. He said in verse 18, dude, why do you call me good? Jesus said. Only God is truly good. Now, a couple of things strike me about verse number 18 that I think we should just talk about real quick. Because I think it reveals a flaw in this wealthy young ruler's process of thinking. First of all, I think it reveals something about the way he viewed this good teacher. See, all rabbinical teachers were good at what they do. They were well-educated. They knew how to handle the Old Testament scriptures and the law. But I want to remind us, Jesus is more than a good teacher. He's the authority of the story. It, it, this is his story that's being written. So this is a story of God's grace. So he's far more. So this guy didn't fully understand that. He wasn't putting 
the pieces together that he's more than just a good rabbinical teacher. He is God. So a little bit of a flaw there for him. But there was a second flaw that I picked up on as I'm reading verse number 18. In the way that he's thinking and he's questioning this, it indicates that he's thinking about works-based salvation. Because he's asking the question, what is it that I can do in order to earn my salvation? What is it that I can do in order to be in favor with God and inherit eternal life? I can just tell you, as verse number 18, Jesus, when he replies to him, he's saying one of two things. Either, I'm not very good, speaking of himself, or I am God. And he answers him this way. He says, and we know he is God. And he answers the question this way in verse 19. He says, sir, you know the commandments. And he begins to list them. And he lists six of them. Uh, don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't testify falsely. Don't cheat on anyone. And honor your father and your mother. So Jesus rattles off six of the Ten Commandments. Now, you might remember that the Ten Commandments are really broken up into two different tables. The first four commandments really deal with a, a vertical relationship between us and God. And the second set, or second table as it would be uh, typically called, are more about a horizontal relationship with others. So the first four commandments talk about our relationship to God. The second set of them, which is six commandments, are about our relationship with other people. And Jesus is saying, hey, are you really doing all of these things well? And then the man responds, teacher, I've obeyed all of these commandments since I was young. I've nailed it on all six of them, he says. I mean, this is a pretty good guy. I can tell you, as I went through the list of all six of these, I can't say that I've kept all six of them. I, I wonder about you. Could you say you've kept all of these six commandments that Jesus has mentioned? This guy says, man, I've been able to do this from the time I was just a kid. I've been able to keep all of these. Oh, here it comes in verse 21. I love the way Jesus handles this. He's looking at the man. Jesus felt genuine love for him. Man. As Jesus looked at him, can you just imagine those eyes of love and compassion going right through this rich young ruler? Now, we know from Mark's gospel that Mark was just a young man when he met Jesus in the garden just at the time of crucifixion. And several decades later when he writes this, he has the influence of Peter's eyewitness account. And Peter is sharing this with him about, man, we had this rich young ruler and Mark, you got to tell about this because I saw those eyes. When Jesus looked at him, I saw the love. I mean, compassion, it was authentic, it was genuine. I know that because I know when he did that for me. And after I denied him three times, I got chill bumps, friend. I denied him three times on the night that he needed me the most. And Jesus looked at me with those eyes of love and compassion. I know what this guy was going through. I saw that look. And Jesus felt this genuine love for him. And Jesus said to the man, there's still one thing you've not done. He told him, you need to go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then, after you've sold it all, friend, then you can come follow me. So imagine a young, well-educated, wealthy ruler. A good guy, man. He's kept all these commandments. He's told Jesus, I've been able to keep them all but you're asking me to go sell everything and give it to the poor? Uh, really? I, I've worked hard to get this money. I, I, I've, I've put money into my savings. I've got money into my, my IRA account. I got, I've got the tax system in my favor. At this, verse 22, the man's face fell. When he heard what Jesus was calling him to do, his face fell. And he went away sad. We had many possessions. I can tell you, friend, this is a heartbreaking moment. He's so close to Jesus, and yet so far from heaven. Listen, 
I was thinking about a way that maybe I could help you to understand this a little bit better. And I know this is going to be kind of a stretch, but maybe this will help you. Have you ever been to the dentist? I've been a number of times. I like to chew gum and eat candy. So the dentist is just part of my regular rhythm of life. I go twice a year at least to have teeth cleaning, all that stuff. Well, I like my dentist. I have a really great dentist here in the Tavares area. Um, I've had good dentists throughout different places where we've lived. You ever been to a dentist? And by the way, if you're a dentist out there, know that I love you, but there is something about you that is unpleasant, and it's called the dental chair. It's when we sit down in that chair, and somebody picks up one of these long, it's like this metal stick, a stainless steel little probe, and it's got this really sharp little thing on the end of it like a hook, and you start probing into the teeth and into the crevices of our teeth and our gums, and then the inevitable question is going to come. As you're poking and prodding in my teeth or your teeth, they're going to ask that question. Um, does it hurt? Yes, it hurt. Yes, 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 yes. I mean, that's kind of the way it goes. Well, that's really what Jesus is doing here. He's like probing. He's picking at this guy to help expose something that needs to be fixed. I can tell you, man, this is how Jesus is working with this rich young ruler. He's letting him know, okay, so you've been able to keep all six of the commandments. You've confidently told me that you've done this. Well, why don't you just go sell all of your possessions and give them away? To which you might go, now wait a minute, Pastor, um... I don't recall not being wealthy or lack of wealth being a commandment. Hey, i got to be poor, and that's one of the commandments. It's not one of the commandments, but you know what is one of the commandments? It's the very first one that said, I am the Lord, and you must not have any other God before me. No other gods but me. At this point, the man realized that he had something more important in his life than God. And it was his wealth, his riches, his possessions. He may not have been a violator of the other six, but he certainly was a violator of commandment number one. The money was just more important to this man than God, than having a relationship. What about you? The things that you own, the things that you've purchased, the material things you've got, are they more important to you than a relationship with God? Because this man walked away and he was sad. I wonder how many people believe that if they just do enough good things, man, if I just keep six of the Ten Commandments, maybe God will let me slide on one or two of these. I can tell you, there's nothing we can do to earn our salvation. You and I cannot earn our way into heaven because it's already been purchased for us. Friend, that's the good news of Jesus. See, a works-based salvation is one of the ploys and lies of the devil. He wants people to believe that you could do enough good deeds like the sixth of this rich, wealthy man. He's kept six of the commandments. Salvation is clearly defined in the Bible as an act of God's grace. You are saved by believing in faith in what Jesus Christ has done, and then salvation is kept by Him, not by us. Our works are just an indication of our transformation. Matter of fact, I love the passage in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. In the New Living Translation, it says it this way. In Ephesians, Paul writes this, Regarding salvation, he said, God saved you by His grace when you believed. You can't take credit for it. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done. In other words, if you did do a bunch of good things, all you do is boast about it. So he does this so that none of us can boast. Friend, none of us are perfect. I'm not, you're not. We all sin. So it's not about, this passage in Mark chapter 10 is not about how many good things can we do? Can I keep all of these different commandments and then hopefully, please God, let me in? No. He's saying to this man, listen, this isn't about keeping all of the law. Salvation comes through Christ. 
It is an act of God's grace. It's not something that we deserve. It's something that we can get because of what Jesus has done. But it requires you and I accepting by faith what Christ has done. In other words, we humble ourselves and recognize that we can't do it on our own. There's nothing we can do to earn it. So we give our life in faith to Jesus. See, that's moving beyond head knowledge to a heart knowledge. Knowing that Christ came, He lived a sinless life, and He took our sin on Him at the cross. Friend, have you ever thought about it this way? Because this rich man, he had a God in his life that took precedence over the God of gods. And it was money and possessions. And that's the one thing that kept him from giving his life humbly in faith to Jesus. Don't let something, possessions, whatever it is, don't let something come between you and knowing God. He loves you. He sent Jesus to die for you. So admit that you're a sinner. Man, we all sin and believe that Jesus is who he said he is. He came, he lived for 33 years on this earth without any sin until he went to the cross and he took your sin and my sin on him. The scriptures say he became sin. One who knew no sin became sin for us. And God looked on him and had to turn his back because it was so grotesque the sin that was on his perfect son. And that day he died on the cross for you and I, shedding his blood so that you and I could have the forgiveness of sin and be reconciled back to the Father. And God said, this is my plan. If you'll embrace what Jesus does, listen, you can do all kinds of good things. I'm okay with that. They are just evidence of your salvation. But salvation is found in the person of Jesus. And it goes beyond head knowledge the heart knowledge. Have you invited him in? Right now, would you do that? If you've never done right now, it makes sense to you. Invite him in. I want you to say something like this because it comes from confession. Romans 10, 9. Romans 10, 13 says that if we'll confess with our mouth, believe in our heart that God's raised Jesus from the dead, we can be saved. So right now, I want you to pray something like this. God, I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me. And I believe Jesus is the only way to forgiveness and salvation. Today, I invite you into my heart. I give you my life in return. I believe that Jesus died on a cross. I believe he was buried for three days, and I believe he rose again on the third day. And the best I know how by faith today, I'm giving you my life. I'm moving past just head knowledge to the purposeful knowledge of knowing you in my heart and having relationship. Today, I call on you to save me. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, if that's you today, man, welcome to the family of God. I made that choice at 17 to accept Jesus. You made that decision today. You need to let someone know. Reach out to us. You can put it right there in the comment section. Let us know, email us, uh, call us, whatever. Show up in person because we want to help you in your new journey. What an awesome day as we read Mark chapter 10 about a man. Sad that he chose to reject, but super good news that we can understand fully from Jesus what it means to inherit eternal life. So, hey, like this message and send it. Help us out. By, by liking our social media and send this to everybody. Man, you know somebody that doesn't know Jesus and maybe they're trying to work their way to heaven? Here's a great message. And just say, hey, would you take the next few minutes and watch this sermon from Pastor David in the fellowship? And I pray that this would be used and multiplied so that many scores of people would come to know Jesus. So thanks for being a part today. We love you. And I want you to know, even greater than our love for you, God loves you. I look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you so much for those of you that give to make this possible. And we'll look forward to continuing our study of the Word of God with you next week. Have a great week.